you okay with my shoes that one? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I'm not used to talking on my phone, so if I talk at that volume, is that okay? Do you want to shout on anybody? <laughs> no, okay. Um, should we just check the clickers, quickly? Yes, it is. Brilliant. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Doug. I work in the Environment Group at Devon County Council, and uh, I'm leading the Devon Climate Emergency Project. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, what the emergency process is trying to do, uh, the carbon plan process, but I'm also going to talk to you very briefly um, about the adaptation process as well, which as you've just seen, the climate is going to continue to change for the next 20 years at least, um, despite what we do about carbon emissions. I'm going to talk to you about an interim plan that we already have published, the Citizens Assembly that met this summer, and I'm then going to take you through some projects that the partnership is already implementing, and whilst I'm doing that, I'm going to sort of relate that to how our lives will be affected um, by those projects. Um, okay, so on we go. So the partnership itself, uh, we have about 29 organisations now collaborating, and the principal objective of the partnership is to be trying to get Devon to net zero by 2050. But the key point is that we have those words at the latest at the end. So we can get a bit hung up on net zero dates. The partners are committed to reducing emissions as fast as we can, and that's the key point. So we want to reduce those emissions rapidly, and there will be residual emissions beyond 2030, 2040, as technologies come online. Let me give you one example of that. Currently, Devon County Council is required by law to take children to school on school buses. It's unlikely by 2030 that those school buses are going to be converted to hydrogen or electricity because the technology won't be caught up. Um, and so we'll have to be using some degree of offsetting and there is uncertainty about how we're going to be able to do that post-2030. But we're going to be doing all sorts of other things before 2030 so that hopefully those school buses are just a small amount of carbon compared to what we're currently emitting. There are all sorts of other examples there that mean that 2030, which I know many of you would like to see happen for net zero, is very, very challenging. Um, we need to improve resilience of Devon's environment. So this is the point already made that this is an ecological emergency as well, and the partners are acting and wanting to act on both. I've already raised the offsetting point. There is a massive opportunity to seize funding from the big corporate organisations that want to be showing their stakeholders and their investors that they are becoming carbon neutral by getting that money to invest right here in Devon, in terrestrial environments and marine environments. Huge scope to improve the marine environment particularly and to sequester carbon. Right, I'm um, going to show you some, pro some processing bits to show you how the project's working. Our response group, that's sort of our project board, that's where the chief executives and the senior leaders of those organisations meet, they meet once a month, and it's chaired by Devon County Council's chief executive. Underneath that we have a doing group, I chair that one, and that's the project officer level, that's where most of the, um, the activity happens. And underneath that one we have two uh, delivery groups, sorry I'm going to go around that one, stand over this side. Um, you can't see me though, can you? I'll, I'll move around a little bit. Um, and uh, in fact, it sounds like that's probably better, isn't it? So the net zero task force, this is the group that's taking forward the carbon plan. They are led by a gentleman called uh, Professor Patrick Weinwright at the University of Exeter. He's an IPCC lead author, so he's been involved in that sixth assessment report. And he's joined by 14 others, other experts and community representatives. They're all volunteers. They were invited by the partnership to provide some independent guidance to the production of the carbon plan. So it's an evidence-led plan. On the other side there we have the Climate Impacts Group, they're taking forward a Devon, Cornwall and Isles of Sydney adaptation plan. It's a bigger geography and that's because that group is led by the Environment Agency, it's the regional manager of the Environment Agency leads that group and there are other partners on that group that represent a bigger geography, so it makes sense that we're working together on that one. Just a little bit on emissions, um, so the, this pie chart is showing you the, uh, the breakdown Devon's carbon emissions, including Plymouth and Torbay. Um, for political reasons, Devon is separate, but for the project, Plymouth and Torbay are involved. The reason that data is only up until 2019, we're about 8, 8 million tonnes of carbon. Um, the reason it's only until 2019 is because we rely on some government data in order to crunch the numbers to get a bit of Devon footprint. 
and, and the government data comes out about two years behind the emissions. So this is hot off the press actually, the 2019 data arrived in my mailbox about two weeks ago. You can see it's coming down, slowly, it's coming down. Um, that's largely due to the decarbonisation of the electricity grid, um, due to Britain's success at deploying offshore wind principally, which we are currently leading the world. 42% of Durban's emissions are houses and commercial property, 30% transport. Um, and then in the West Country, particularly in Devon, this section is quite significant, which is emissions from land and agriculture. So that's not emissions from any um, transport or buildings used in agriculture and land management. Those are the emissions from ruminating animals, uh, application of fertilizer, things like that. So you go, Look at, for example, Exeter's emissions. This, pipe, this bit of the wedge is really, really tiny. But we've got to remember that people in Exeter are still consuming food. So. Okay, um, right, this is our process. And you're going to look at this and you're going to say, really? It's taking that long? And partly that is because we have um, 12 local authorities, two national parks, plus the other partners collaborating on this project. And essentially, democracy takes time. But I'm going to come on to projects towards the end of this presentation to show you that whilst this process is going on, we are taking action. The emergency was declared in 2019, and the first thing that happened was that we had uh, what we call a public call for evidence. So we asked the public to tell us what they would like to see in the carbon plan. We had a youth parliament event that was organised by them, and we also had a set of themed hearings. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those in a moment. And then COVID happened. So what was going to happen is that we pop out of our evidence card on the stage and we go into a citizens assembly. And I'll say more about the assembly in a moment. But that couldn't happen because it was going to be a physical assembly. And suddenly we were all working from home, not meeting. But we wanted to crack on with things. So what we ended up doing was taking forward an interim Devon Carbon Plan. And that has in it the elements that our politicians felt were not particularly controversial. Difficult, but not particularly controversial. So that's this top row. Last December we had a consultation on that plan, and we're in the process of producing an updated version of it. It's on the website already in the consultation version. Alongside that, we then took issues that are considered controversial, there are three of them, and I'll come on to them later, to an online assembly, which has just happened in July. Their report was published this week. It's on the website, on the Devon Climate Emergency website. And then we will take the actions that the partners develop uh, from the assembly and we'll combine that with the interim plan to create the final plan. Now this is August here, because between March next year when you, the public, will have a chance to tell us, the lack of councils, how we got it right and how we interpreted what the assembly has said. Again, we've got, the reason there's a big gap there is because, again, we've got the 12 local authorities that will need to agree on what goes in that final plan. And actually, I'm being told by some of the authorities that that's too quick, but we're going to try, okay? So, a little bit more detail on what, what actually happened. So, that call for evidence, it was over three months, we had about 900 submissions from the public, which is fantastic. Um, a wide range of suggestions, some very detailed, some very broad. They were all read, they were all considered. And they're all on the website. We had a set of themed hearings across these topics here. Actually, at the back, can you see the text? Yeah, okay. Um, and they happened in December 2019. And they were round table discussions. Here they are happening. Uh, they were held around the county. They were live streamed on Facebook. Recordings are on the website if anybody wanted to read them, uh, watch them. And they were essentially asking a question back on those topics to about 15 or so invited people from communities, businesses, academia, what are the barriers in Devon to decarbonising those sectors? And therefore, what actions could we put in the plan that would overcome those barriers? And we were looking at high level strategic issues, which is what the Devon Carbon Plan is. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Youth Parliament organised their own event, 15 schools came along to that, so we heard from primary schools and secondary schools uh, what they would like to see in the Devon Carbon Plan and happening in their schools, so that's been fed in. We had over 1,300 responses to the consultation last December. Um, clearly, there's a percentage 
of Devon's residents, that's not a massive amount. Uh, but I've been told uh, from the Brexit authority communications teams that these sorts of consultations, that's quite good. Um, but you all told us that the plan is more concise. It's welcomed that people can see that evidence has been provided, research has been done, but we need to make the final version of the website a lot more concise so we can get to the actions and see what, what's being done. So that's what will happen. There's the new file event happening. Uh, some tree planting. This gentleman is wearing interesting trousers because when he bent down to help dig the hole, his trousers split. And then find for us some answer and put it back on. Um, right, I appreciate you might not be able to see some of this from the back, so um, I'll try and paraphrase some of this. Um, so what does the interim carbon plan do? Right, so we base it on the IPC, sorry, the Committee on Climate Change, I haven't even mentioned this in yet, have I? So the Committee on Climate Change, they have the UK's independent advisory body, they advise government. And we base the interim carbon plan on their um, further ambition scenario. So they produce a scenario of technology, social change, behaviour change, um, and um, it's not their latest, the latest one, they produced another one about a year ago now. Our report's based on the fifth one. So we've taken that technology and behaviour change pathway and we want the University of Exeter helped us bring that down to Devon. So in the Committee on Climate Change scenario, they, they talk about literally numbers of houses that will be insulated, uh, number of car charges that will be installed, um, the amount of meat that will be continuing to eat in our diets. They make assumptions about those things and we brought that down to the Devon level and we put it into the carbon plan. So that's how we've done it. It has an interim target to reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 on 2010 levels, which due to a bit of smoke and mirrors is the same as the UK government's target in their um, submissions to the COP26 conference, but they use 1990 as the baseline just to confuse people, but it's generally the same. <coughs> um, as I said earlier, it overcomes the big challenges to reaching net zero in Devon. So it's, the idea is that it nests with other levels of plan. So the district councils in Devon and Torbay and Plymouth, they have aspirations to produce their own plans, many of them already have, and they'll be being updated iteratively. Uh, parish councils wish to produce their own plans and communities want to produce their own plans. And the idea is that those districts and those parishes can look at the Devon wide plan and they can see, yes, that action's relevant to us, that one's relevant to us, that one is, and we'll bring those down into our local level plan. So it's not a plan for the county council, it's not a plan just for the partnership, it's a plan for everybody and all organisations in Devon. So hopefully everyone can pick up the plan when it's much shorter <laughs> and see something in there that's relevant to you or your organisation and you can help implement it. In terms of funding, the Commission on Climate Change has said we will need trillions of investment to achieve that, billions of pounds every year. A lot of that will not come from the public purse because there are investment opportunities which the private sector will want to get involved in because there's money to be made. There are various opportunities that won't currently make money and that's where the public purse will need to come in to subsidise, just as it does for renewable energy and of course perhaps more controversially it still does fossil fuel. So most of the actions in the plan need new resources and funding and it makes no bones about that. So essentially it's, it's a blueprint for how we get to net zero. It doesn't say specifically how those projects are going to be implemented. We simply don't know. Yet. It has the, the, the sections on the, on the right hand side of the slide there, is, is how it's breaking down. So the Citizens Assembly itself, which has just happened, we took advice from the University of Exeter about how to run a Citizens Assembly. They reviewed how they've been used elsewhere. And they did that twice. They did it once for an, uh, an offline assembly, a physical one, and they did it again for us for an online one. So, so, so we've had independent advice on how to do it. We've got seven, we had 70 people. Um, we sent out invitations to 14,000 people initially for the postcode database. Of those 14,000 people, about 1,000 got back to us saying they'd be interested to take part. There was an incentive of 400 pounds each to take part in the assembly. The idea of that was that we didn't have the uh, the usual suspects, shall we say. We had people who weren't that interested in climate change. And indeed, the climate skeptics. There were climate skeptics in the room. And we made sure that the percentage of the 70 that were climate skeptics reflected the percentage that we 
know, I mean, in the UK, there's a climate change attitude survey that the UK government does every year. We based it on that. So in that room, there were about three climate like sceptics, because that's actually, when you look at attitudinal data, that's about the right percentage in the UK. So the 70 represented the demographics of data, geography, age, education level, income level, um, what types of newspapers they read, all those sorts of things. The, the 70 were a little enclave of them, but only as the 70. We started breaking it down below the 70, it didn't work. They met online for 25 hours. They were led by a company called Involve, which is the company that ran the UK and the Scottish Climate Assembly, so we were in good hands. Now importantly, they initially were engaged in upscaling their own knowledge on climate change. So what they have said needs to happen in Devon to respond to climate change is not what you would get if you stop 70 people in Morrisons. It's what you get if you potentially stop 70 people in Morrisons, having had eight hours initially of explaining why the climate emergency has been called a climate emergency. And the feedback we've got from those 70 people is that most of them did not realise why it's being called an emergency, but they're fully up to speed with that now and they completely agree. So when we come to implementing projects, some of which will change our lives, we'll come on to those, the partnership is going to have to make sure that we continue uh, and increase the amount of engagement that we do as to why we're implementing those projects. But the message we've heard is that currently a lot of people don't really understand why it's being called the emergency that it is. I need to embrace three big things that are not in the interim carbon plan. They're mentioned as being discussed by the Assembly, but they're not resolved in the carbon plan. How should we encourage people to reduce car use? Because that's what there's a, a next sentence about, which is about whilst maintaining mobility. Clearly, you don't want people to not be able to access services and leisure, etc. How should we encourage people to retrofit buildings more quickly? People are retrofitting buildings, but it's far too slow. And, and what should the role of onshore wind energy be in Devon? Um, onshore wind is not, has not historically been liked in Devon politically. You can see that as soon as you drive over the Tamar into Cornwall and you have all the wind turbines. That, that's essentially politic, local politics that, that has achieved that difference. And they've produced a series of resolutions, and there are conditions attached to those resolutions. They're all in the report. I'm going to summarise them very briefly on the next slide. But we've also been given some general tips as to what we need to be doing as well. Um, leadership, I've already mentioned communication. They want us to involve communities, I think that's key. We shouldn't be doing things to people, you want to always, you need to be involved. We've tried to do that through the consultation that we've been doing already. Act with urgency and show, show ambition. So, well, basically, this is a fantastic mandate to the politicians to get on with it. I'm going to start by highlighting my text at the top there, which is quite paraphrase this. And um, there are conditions that the Assembly have put on some of the things I've put here, um, which need to be taken alongside these three bullet points here, which I'll, I'll try and explain. So, energy uh, and, and wind. Massive support for onshore wind from the Assembly. About 90% of the Assembly participants want to see more onshore wind in Devon. It's the cheapest form of renewable electricity alongside solar farms. It's efficient uh, in the sense that it, um, it generates electricity more of the time than solar farms do. But one of the caveats they've got in one of the conditions is they'd like to see as much of it as possible controlled locally and owned by communities and you all having a say in where it goes. Transport, much more quickly. Strong support for electrification of vehicles. That's not a silver bullet though because there are other issues with vehicles generally, not least the microplastics issue, and uh, whilst cotton buds and straws tend to be the focus, a lot of the stuff in the ocean is not those at all, it's tyre dust. Um, and um, the vehicle manufacturers claim to be working on some miracle solve for that, but until that happens, electrification cannot be the silver bullet. It will be important in Devon because we have such a disparate geography which will never have regular bus services and active travel opportunities to, to displace all car travel. Not unless we want to pay for it through taxes, which we also heard of the Assembly people don't want to do that. <coughs> Some support for congestion charging, very little support for increased car park charging or workplace parking levies to disincentivise people from using cars and to raise revenue. And they want to see sustainable alternatives in place first. That's quite a challenge because we 
what we were hoping they were going to say was, yes, we love car park charging and workplace parking levies, and we'd like you to do that first, and you've got the money to pay for the increase uh, public transport and uh, the active travel infrastructure. But they didn't say that at all. And the buildings, some support for using regulation to require people to upgrade their homes. Um, and the example of that is that there are ways we can use the planning system to do that. We've got those powers already, so for example, if somebody uh, has a conservatory or an extension done to their property, we could, through planning conditions, require them to upgrade the rest of the building's energy efficiency at the same time. There was also already a trial done in East Wales, it was a trial, that's a lot. Uh, there was some, um, some research done uh, a couple of years ago, funded by government, into linking council tax and business rates to energy efficiency. It's essentially looking at how people, how acceptable it would be to people um, if we said, you show us that you increase the energy efficiency of your property and we'll give you a rebate on your council tax, essentially. And largely people were not, not too unhappy about that. Um, so we need to really go to the government to find out what we could do next, having government pay for a trial right here in East Devon. Right, the adaptation plan. Um, I've already told you that the output is a wider geography. Where we've got to with this is that the Met Office have produced a, a projections report for us that's based on something called the um, UK Climate Impacts Programme 2018 climate projections. Um, they produce projections on a uh, five quality grid. Is that be right? Okay. It's a five quality grid. Um, so you can imagine that then with five kilometer grid squares overlaid all over it. So you can click on a grid square and it will tell you all sorts of different meteorological projections for different time periods into the future. So they, they produce that data for us. And we've used something called the um, Community Risk Register that already exists. It's a register that's maintained by an organisation called the Local Resilience Forum. That's led by Devon and Cornwall Police. And they're the organisations that come together when, for example, the M5 is shut for a long time, there's a bomb threat or Exeter Airport has a plane crash, something like that. That organisation maintains this risk register. So we've been through that register and we've looked at which community risks will be affected by climate change. And we've considered what risks will come along due to climate change that aren't already in that register. And we're now at the point of talking to other organisations that are responsible for managing our preparedness for those risks to find out how prepared they are and where the gaps are in the preparedness those become our actions to plug those gaps that will go into the adaptation plan. This part of the process is currently much less resourced than the carbon reduction side. We've just submitted an application to the Environment Agency for some money to get a full-time member of staff to move this forward. Which is really quite pressing considering some of you might have seen in the press last week, the Environment Agency put out a statement and its headline was, uh, Adapt to Climate Change, uh, Do or Die. Which you think about it, from a government funded agency, that's very strong language indeed. How much is the time? Fine? Okay. So, just coming on to the final parts of the presentation, I'll just take you through some projects that are happening and we'll link these to how they will affect us in the future. The, the imminent future, we will hope. Over 200 electric vehicle charge posts will be installed in Devon across market towns and coastal towns by next December. And they're just going into Exeter now. Um, so we're talk about electrification not being a silver bullet, but it's a quick solution. The technology is here, you know, we all know you can go and buy, you can go buy second hand electric car now. Yes, okay, they're not cheap, but those of us who can afford it can jump on that um, initiative and start helping reduce emissions. So, you know, it's quite an easy thing really for those of us that can afford it, switching to electrification. If we can charge at home currently, but once all these electric charge points come out, most of these are going to be rapid, they'll get to charge your vehicle up um, in about 45 minutes, that sort of speed. County Council just submitted a bid for a 34 million bus service improvement plan that was submitted last week. The sorts of measures that are in there are bus prioritisation on the highway. Um, better timetabling, joined up ticketing so you can use the same ticket on the bus as you can on the train, that sort of thing like you can in London. 
um, electrification and hydrogen trialling of the buses themselves. So that's a really good package of measures. So we will all be needing to consider can we use public transport um, instead of a private vehicle, even if it is electric, because remember we've still got all those other issues that come with electric vehicles. Marshbank Railway Station is being constructed right now. You can go and have a look at it. That picture was taken uh, about three months ago. The energy from waste facilities is just there. You, you know where that is in Exeter. And over on the other side there, we have a number of um, cycling and active travel initiatives underway in the county. This particular one is extending the cycle route that goes from Exeter down to Dawlish, so that it goes all the way through to Newton Abbott. Um, so there's various consultations open about that now. Clearly, Devon's topography is an issue. And this particular route, many of you know that particular route, it will never be flat. <laughs> um, however, electric bikes, I think they could be a silver bullet. Not when it's raining, potentially, because nobody likes getting wet, do they? But they're much more affordable than electric cars. I was looking on the Evan Cycles website last week. You can buy an electric bike with a 50 mile range for £1,000. Um, and I, th I think that could be a game changer. You can put, you can put uh, your trailer on them um, and they can cope with Devon's topography. So, you know, I think we need to get away from bikes being considered a leisure activity towards actually a bike could be a really useful way of doing short, even medium distance journeys when the sun's shining. New parking change site is open at the exercise park, so that's essentially expanding park and ride capacity. So in terms of future, how the future will be, we need to try and reduce private car use inside urban areas. Give the highway space back over to active travel, walking, cycling. Uh, the highway prioritisation for buses, so that you can easily get from the park and ride site into the middle of town quickly. Um, and the Connecting Devon Somerset programme has been going on for a number of years now. It's coming to its final stages, but there's a further 56,000 properties that will have the superfast broadband installed in the next couple of years. We all know the huge shift that has happened in home working um, due to COVID. Certainly, at the County Council and fairly sure most of the other district councils in Devon, that's going to continue on a flexible basis. We're looking at uh, returning to the office probably on a one day per week basis, and we will be working from home. There is a report on the website that the University of Exeter has produced showing the benefits of home working for the climate. Now, these sorts of studies are hugely dependent on the scope of the study, the line that's drawn around what you're going to include and exclude from the study. But um, the one we've had done is fairly comprehensive. And what it does include is the idea that if you've got fewer people coming into the office regularly, you can then dispose of office space, which means that you reduce the demand for new office space because you know, companies that are growing and new companies can then move into your office space. So you're offsetting, well, offsetting is the wrong word, you're avoiding the embodied carbon that would be involved in the demand for new office space. If you start including that, the benefits are huge. Talking to 80% reductions per, um, on an annual basis per member staff by working at home if your organisation can reduce its office capacity. Oakhampton okay, train station, that's going to be reopening in November, um, and there are other branch lines in Devon that have sort of communities coming together to try to get their branch lines reopened as well. So that's transport. Food, land, and sea, another theme of the, of the carbon plan. The local nature partnership is coming together to put something in place called a, um, a nature recovery network. This is really important. It goes back to what has been said about we can't be responding to the climate emergency at the expense of other parts of the environment. Tree planting in the wrong place can be catastrophic for the environment. If we were to uh, plant trees up on Dartmoor where there is wet peat, um, that would dry the peat out and that would release methane. So we just need to do that carefully. Um, so part of this nature recovery network is that it will essentially identify uh, land areas, habitat types 
and suggest where habitat should be enhanced, expanded, reinstated, um, and that will guide the, sort of, uh, the, the, the investment opportunity that's going to come along in climate change in Devon. So that's a really important piece of work. Devon Wildlife Trust are leading that one. We've got the Devon Food Partnership has been created in the last year. Um, that's looking at providing healthy food for all and sustainable food for the planet. Now you might have noticed what I haven't said there is that we should all be eating much less red meat and dairy. That comes down to politics with a small p. Because in Devon we have lots of landowners, lots of farmers, the energy is very active, young farmers, etc. And we need to support them through the transition. Um, but action's already happening. You're probably aware of the report that came out last week that said we were all eating something like 17% less red meat and dairy than we were about 15 years ago. So that's already happening. That's probably the extreme dream to achieve that 17% reduction. So once everybody else gets on board with one or two days a week less red meat and dairy, that, that, that could be quite a big shift in the next few years. In terms of the healthy bit, there is an NHS guide, the Eat Well Guide, and it states that in Western, Western economies, UK included, we were all eating far too much red meat and dairy to be healthy. Um, so there's a real win-win there for the environment and uh, us if we can you know, help, help the farmers transition to, to other uh, ways of making money for them. A land use framework. Now, if you think about all the decisions that are taken by all sorts of different bodies about what we do with land, we need land for housing, employment, transport, food, wildlife, recreation, waste disposal, quarries. There's nothing that brings all that together to say, are we actually using land to best effect? Are we getting the best value from our land? So the idea is that we'll have a land use framework. Scotland has one. And the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission started a project in Devon. It was a pilot. And they've done that in Devon because we've got the Devon Carbon Plan that says we want a land use framework. So they put their hands up and they said, well, we'll help you do that. So this has started and it will be founded on the Nature Recovery Network. So it will be nature first, and then where you put all the energy, the transport, the housing, etc. after that. So in terms of the countryside, sorry, I should be thinking about how this affects us tonight. So in terms of the countryside, we're looking at the Sid Valley in Sidmouth. Potentially the tapestry of the landscape will need to, need to change for the better. The habitats will be extended, farmers will be doing things differently. Farmers through the new agricultural payment scheme will hopefully be being paid for ecosystem services, services providing things to us, um, flood water capacity, um, pollination services, um, nutrient cycling, enhancing, enhancing soil. They'll be being paid to do those sorts of things. So you might see, you might see fewer, fewer crops, fewer animals grazing, but the farmers will still be being paid to manage the landscape. That landscape will change. Okay, buildings. We have a same wall project running. Six million pounds, we got up that place for about 600 houses. And there are the best part of half a million houses in Devon. So that shows you the scale of the problem. But again, massive co-benefits that we need to sell. Most of us have probably got double glazing around houses. None of us did that for thermal efficiency reasons. But we did, we got the numbers wrong. Because double glazing doesn't pay for itself for thermal efficiency reasons. You probably did it for security, you probably did it for noise, you probably did it for the aesthetic, perhaps, for your house, and you did it also for thermal efficiency. You add all those things up, and then you think, yes, I want double glazing. But isn't it interesting that when we think about internal or external wall insulation, we don't think about those things, we just look at the numbers and say, well, that doesn't pay back, so let's not worry about that. So we've got to change the rhetoric around the fact that actually we should all be living in warmer, more comfortable homes, because after all, that's what a home should be doing. Whereas I think in Britain we have, we've got a bit of a habit of talking about home as an asset, haven't we? Treating it a bit of a, as a business almost. And then public buildings, we've got a project running at the moment, we've got a grant from government to retrofit uh, a few of our uh, public buildings. Sorts of things that will be going in there, air source heat pumps alongside insulation. The issue with air source heat pumps is that they run at a very low temperature, about 40 degrees rather than 80 degrees, which is what your gas boiler will be pumping water to your radiators through if you've got central heating. So you have to increase the insulation of the property before you put the heat pump in. And that's a problem for some historic buildings. We 
historic buildings, you'll be looking at things um, more like, um, uh, well, in the longer term, potentially uh, hydrogen actually, hydrogen boilers, possibly linked to a heat pump, so the hydrogen would uh, kick in in the depth of where you said to top up what the heat pump can achieve. Um, there are also solid state boilers coming along, they're being developed by universities at the moment. Um, you know, sort of hand warmers that you can buy in an outdoor shop and you put in your gloves, a little chemical reaction. It's sort of based on that sort of technology, but ramped up so that it's able to provide instant heat in a home setting. So essentially our homes will become warmer and we'll need to insulate and change energy supplies to do that. And the section of the plan is about energy supply. This isn't about how we use the energy, which is what the other sections of the plan look at. This section is about where the energy comes from in the first place. Now we've already talked about wind, but what we've got in Devon is already a really strong community energy sector. We've got one of the strongest in the, in the UK. Now what that means is that communities have come together to own and operate renewable energy schemes. Um, the nearest one to you that's active is Exeter Community Energy. They have solar panels on various buildings around Exeter and its environs. And local people have taken a share in those schemes. They've invested some money and they benefit each year from a modest return on their investment. And the green energy gets sold to the owner of the building. Um, this is a photograph taken of a solar farm down near Newton Ferris. Down in South Hams, there's a group down there called Yelm Community Energy. They have two solar farms that they own as a community. Um, and the County Council has launched a £200,000 fund to help any more communities that want to do that to get their own schemes off the ground. We can own the energy infrastructure locally, the profits stay locally. And those community interest companies can reinvest those profits on anything else they want to in their community rather than going off to one of the big six energy companies. Just coming towards the end, in terms of economy and resources, currently we have, we have a linear, what's called a linear economy, generally. We dig things out of the ground, we turn them into something that we consider useful, we use that thing and we dispose of it and if we're lucky it gets recycled and some of those materials might end up back at the start, but generally it gets disposed. We need to move to a circular economy, and, and, and that is happening in parts of, the, parts of the economy, whereby all of those materials at the end of use get put back into the start. Um, I was interested, I was looking at the, uh, the carbon impact on my phone the other day, and I was reading their environmental report. Um, now, I don't know if it's been audited, but what they, what they tell us is that actually 98% of the rare earths that come out of an iPhone when it's recycled, those metals that are used in the, um, the, uh, the batteries and the circuit conductors and things, do get put back in to new iPhones. 98% of it. I don't know if I believe that or not, but that's what they say. That's where we've got to get to. Um, and uh, yeah, that's called the circular economy. And businesses have got to start thinking about end of life resources as being somebody else's opportunity and just paying somebody to take it away. Um, we just really sort of an £900,000 green innovation fund to develop. If anybody's got any ideas, it's generally aimed at, at businesses. If they've got an idea that needs a bit of money to help develop a new product, new technology that can help with delegates in zero, that fund is open um, and can help them do that. Just very finally, keeping up to date, please do sign up to the newsletter that's on that website, that web address, devonclimateemergency.org. Um, it comes out monthly. Um, please sign up. If you don't like it, you can just click on subscribe when you receive it, and we're on social media, etc. So I hope it's giving you an overview of what the partnership is trying to do. Hopefully, it's giving you a bit of insight into why it's going at the speed that it is because we've got all of those democratic organisations involved, which we are, I'd say successfully, getting to work together, and also giving you an insight into what is already happening alongside that procedure, to give you some confidence that um, we are aware that it's an emergency and we are taking action. <laughs>